Welcome back and welcome to our political commentator, Colin James, who's in Auckland for a conference on Norman Kirk. Hi, Colin. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. You knew uh, Norman Kirk. You wrote a book about him. Where does he stand in political history, do you well, think? Well, I and Jim Eagles wrote a, a sort of quickie post-election book, Making of a New Zealand Prime Minister. Um, he stands uh, bestride two eras, I think, and I've just been thinking this through again in this last week or so. He was the small L Labour man. The Labour Party came from the Labour movement, from the uh, from the manual workers, uh, uh, th those sorts of people, and he was very much one of those. His father was, he was very much in that mould. But he was also, as we saw, he anticipated a bicultural New Zealand. I wouldn't say he, he had it there, but he anticipated it, and he also anticip anticipated a much more independent New Zealand. So we had the small L Labour Prime Minister and the uh, a New Zealand Prime Minister, the first real New Zealand Prime Minister, a sort of pivot in our history, I think. And he, and he perhaps um, pulled New Zealand a wee bit away from, as we heard then in that panel just before now, away from Europe and, and quite off the cuff, you know, started to align a little bit with America and Asia. Uh, yes, he did that, uh, which was uh, quite important at the time because of the entry into the Britain's entry into the EEC. We had to diversify markets and so on. He was well aware of that. But it was deeper than that. It was a sense of New Zealandness, and he did talk about that quite a bit uh, right through his leadership, particularly in the latter part of his leadership, leading up to being Prime Minister. He talked about uh, a New Zealandness. Uh, he talked about. Uh, uh, accelerating New Zealand's journey towards nationhood. Uh, he talked about the pol foreign policy must be with a New Zealand voice, those sorts of comments, and New Zealand was important as Labour Party and the party's title and so on. And that was quite different. Before we'd been in the Empire and then the Commonwealth and we were sort of an adjunct, really, a distant adjunct. After that, as the baby boomers, who he didn't really get on with uh, at the time, 20 years later, they made New Zealand an independent uh, nation, and he anticipated that. But if I go back to that bicultural uh, thing, if you go back to 1967, he said this, the laws must take into account the desire of the Maori people to be equal partners in the determination of the country's destiny and pay full heed to the wish of the Maori to retain their culture. Well, that's unusual at the time. Then very we saw unusual. this very powerful image too, didn't we, at Waitangi, which yes, we saw earlier. Yes, and, and I thought Bob just had uh, uh, described that very well, actually, uh, that... Uh, seems just sort of natural, but also well thought through. And Indeed. he was an unusual Prime Minister in that respect. Looking back to when he died, there was a remarkable outpouring of grief, wasn't there? That was quite extraordinary. People talk about uh, the public, which queued mm. for four days to file past his coffin, the, well, the funeral. It's just, <laughs> or does this grow in time? Does the legend grow? Uh, I wasn't here then. I was actually in London. I'd gone at the end of 73, so I, I, I didn't experience that mood. But I often used to wonder whether if you die in office, you get a bigger funeral. And Mickey Joseph Savage had a great funeral as well. Uh, and, uh, or whether that was genuine outpouring. I think it's a mixture of both. He was very popular for sure, wasn't he? He was a popular Prime Minister, even though he cancelled a Springbok tour uh, in 1973, uh, which was not popular with the small L Labour people uh, that he, he otherwise connected with. Uh, he was, I think, uh, someone who the people felt represented them in, in a bigger sort of way. We have to leave it there. All right, Colin James, thank, thank you. you so much.